<laughs> I see you, Morgan. Good to see you. Uh, P.S. Been a minute. It's been a minute. Yeah, good to see you, man. Good to see you as well. Thanks um, for having us. No, God, anytime. Uh, I th- uh, we've made a few shows in the past, Pierre, but we never had Danny with us. Nope. It was the olden days. We used to carry a little, little black case around and a couple of mics, and <laughs> now we've got some mics. Uh, but there's a lot to catch up on. Um, but it's good to see you here with Pierre. Uh, I know you have a husband and wife podcast, which is cool. Um, I, haven't had, I only found out about that today. Uh, so I'll be checking that out. Um, but how was conference for you both? It was good. Yeah, we. Um, it's it's a different experience for sure when you have kids, because you're like trying to balance making sure that they're doing well while also balancing the work stuff. We were just saying that maybe maybe we don't bring the kids next time just to fly in, fly out, and have just more of a conference experience. But otherwise, I mean, it was pretty good. And um, our youngest came to basically all the events. So um, she's only five months, so she didn't really know what was happening. But she, I think she had a good time. I think it depends on their age, because both of mine have been. Uh, Scarlett came when she was 12. Connor yeah. came when he was 19. And they love it. I mean, they get fully involved and hang out and work on the stand and help us. But I think it's different. Probably you've got little ones running around. Right? Yeah, I think when they're a little older, it'll be a little better for this sort of a thing. But every age, there's something good about it for sure. Children of Pierre and natural Bitcoiners, though. <laughs> we'll see. They, they might rebel, get yeah. into Ethereum. We'll see. <laughs> Become communists. That would be like my children supporting Tottenham, and it, it would, would not be allowed in our house. <laughs> uh, Pierre, listen, uh, let's, we've had a big gap since we last made a show, so there would be a lot we could catch up on. Uh, but there are a few things I, I do want to catch up with you on. And uh, Morgan, please jump in and yeah. get fully involved. She's got the inside scoop. Yeah, yeah, on everything. <laughs> uh, I know all the good things. Thank you. Uh, I'm a big fan of Pierre, by the way, because he seems to be right about everything. I'm a big fan of Pierre, too. Yeah, he's got a good track record, and he's a good dad, good husband. I only remember what I was wrong about, so I just have a very different... <laughs> There's that, yeah. I can also remind him of those moments yeah, as well. Yeah. Well, we, we all <laughs> tend to sometimes see that. I I only see the negative comments on YouTube and not the positive ones, but... Right. Uh, I was saying to Danny, I said, the funny thing about Pierre is like, we haven't always seen eye to eye, but whenever there's like something going on, I go to Pierre's Twitter <laughs> to see what his take is. And it's usually like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So a, there's a compliment for you there, Pierre. Uh, Pierre, remind me, when, when did you first get into Bitcoin? I can't remember the actual year. Uh, so um, technically, uh, 2011, I downloaded Bitcoin QT, okay. opened it up, looked for the mining button, uh, didn't find it, closed it, and then forgot about it. And then it came back into my life at, towards the end of 2012 uh, with Michael Goldstein and Daniel Krawis at yeah. UT Austin. And we were debating fractional reserve banking as libertarians. You know, they debate these topics. Um, and they were already into Bitcoin. So uh, they, they're the ones who orange-pilled me. So a good decade. Yeah. So you've, you've lived through uh, all the different kind of epochs of Bitcoin. Uh, whether it's uh, the cypherpunks or the libertarians and the macro people and the cultural people have come in. So you've seen everything. Like, how do you, t- and it's kind of a broad opening question, but how do you take it all in, having been around for a long time? You've witnessed so many changes, so many events. It seems additive, right? The pe- new people come in, but um, for the most part, the existing groups like don't necessarily leave, um, other than some individuals who, you know, get. Bitcoin derangement syndrome and kind of rage quit, which that that to me is always like a, a cautionary tale of like, yeah, I could I I could see myself rage quitting one day. I gotta watch out. I gotta stay <laughs> humble. Uh, yeah, I think also um, just being around as long as we have been, it's it's the same story over and over again with different words, different people, and so like the cycles they they are always very similar in a way, even though, you know, there's always different actors, different coins, different things happening, but it's it's always the same ebb and flow with how it goes. Is, is Pierre responsible for your orange pinning? He actually is, yeah. So I had read about, I was already into Austrian economics before we met. It's actually okay. how we met. Um, and I had read a Mises.org article when it was $2 a coin about Bitcoin and thought that it was pretty cool. 
and thought, well, whatever, I'll just buy, you know, like a hundred bucks of it or whatever. And I went to go buy it. And at the time, Mt. Gox was like, I like as a woman, I didn't really want to do like the local Bitcoins thing because mm. it, I didn't want to like be in some sketchy situation. And so I thought I'd send money to Mt. Gox. But I've been working in financial services now for 15 years. And so when I saw the wire instructions at that time, like they, there was something off about them. And it was because it didn't go into your own account. I didn't really know. And a hundred bucks for me back then was quite a bit. So I just said, whatever. And didn't buy it. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. And then, <laughs> and then like a year later, Pierre and I met and he was talking about Bitcoin on the first date, you know, because he's bit pure. And, and you got a second uh, <laughs> date. That's quite impressive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I wasn't like, I don't, I wouldn't say I was orange pilled on that date, right? I mean, no, we no. had many conversations after that about it, but I wasn't like, I wasn't shunning it. I wasn't. I wasn't turning it away and being like, you're a crazy nut. I printed out articles and like... Yeah. <laughs> for the first date. <laughs> afterwards, afterwards. When things said, yeah. He also printed, which is kind of funny, he left, uh, you printed the Marcus Aurelius stoicism thing. Oh, yeah. He printed that for me. And when I read that, I was like, do you think I'm a crazy person? I need stoicism. <laughs> um, but no, it was just him just being nice. You know, he just wanted to help. <laughs> I, I I won't bring up Bitcoin on a first date. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't do it. Um, the chutzpah fun, this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 you have witnessed a lot. You've been through a lot. Uh, has your views ch changed at all on anything significantly? Um, I mean, I think that the whole like security budget transaction fee stuff. I, my views have changed on that. Okay. Um, but uh, overall, I mean, in terms of the monetary economics. The only thing that's changed is I've just come to accept that it's going to take longer than I thought it would when I first got into Bitcoin. I remember in 2013, I was telling Morgan, like, next year, like, the entire dollar system is going to be replaced by Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, and that didn't pan out. Um, <laughs> and, it, it, you know, trying to understand why it, it takes longer than I would have expected has been, um, you know, fr fruitful intellectually. But... Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it is just, uh, yeah, history takes a long time to unfold. I think we've all expected a uh, pacier adoption of Bitcoin because I think you go down a rabbit hole and you suddenly get it. I, I certainly don't understand it as well as you, but I understand it enough to be irresponsibly long. And you, you keep thinking, why does nobody else get this? I think also Pierre is, um, he's very optimistic. That's something I've always appreciated about him. And so his optimism, though, is that not only is this going to be amazing for humanity, but everyone's going to understand it and get it as quickly as I have. Um, and that optimism, I think, leads you to believe that things will take shorter than they actually do. So what if, has your opinion changed on the security budget? So what, at first, I thought that Bitcoin would end up consuming like 51% of all electricity, and that's how Bitcoin would be secure. So it's kind of just a, like take, taking it from the wrong uh, direction of like starting with, oh, okay, it has to be 51% secure, and so therefore the budget will be that. Um, so that, that, that I think, uh, I, I, then I, I got into this idea that you know, with the block size war that we need to have small blocks because that's what will drive up transaction fees and make Bitcoin secure long term. Then with the adoption of SegWit and, um, you know, when blockchain.com adopted SegWit, I think like 2021, 22, years after the upgrade, when the transaction fees went really low because of that, um, I came to a realization that even if transaction fees go up, all that does is incentivize developers to develop new technologies, whether it's SegWit or Lightning or whatever comes next. Um, and that in turn drives transaction fees back down. And so now I just think transaction fees are going to be volatile uh, whenever you know we kind of hit that ceiling and it incentivizes more innovation, but also different use, use behavior. Right. Um, so batching, for example, and, and things like that. So um, then then the question became, uh, isn't that a problem? Right. Because that would mean that Bitcoin's not secure long term. Um, and that's where I started really digging into, OK, what exactly is going on with the 51 percent attack? And like, why is that an attack per se? And what the conclusion I've come to is that it's really about um, are you able to 
it, it, so the attacker is outbidding you on transaction fees, and are you able to outbid them in return? And so it's kind of just a, a bidding war on transaction fees um, that ultimately, you know, where we fall on whether Bitcoin is secure or not is are the defenders, the honest, you know, transactors able to outbid the people who are trying to double spend them? And um, that because, so, you know, that's an open question uh, because we haven't really seen people try. But I think the reason why we haven't seen attackers try is because it's not, it, there's not a huge economic payoff to performing the attack if you succeed. Um, so it's kind of a high risk, low reward attack. And so um, now I'm just of the mind that the only time transaction fees are going to go up is due to congestion pricing. It's not going to be due to in response to an attack. Um, and the Bitcoin won't really ever be attacked because the game theory of it doesn't make sense for attackers. You don't think it'll ever be attacked on a 50 not yeah not 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 in that 51 percent attack like kind of scenario um and and it all has to do with the mempool and the auction mechanism for transaction fees being driven up in response to an attack is that in terms of uh, an economic attack because there's no economic benefit to the attacker well so I think that then if we get into like, yes, yeah, you know, if we get into uneconomic yeah. attacks, right, of like, let's say, um, uh, mining empty blocks, right, or um, spamming uh, blocks to push out, you know, uh, non-spam transactions. And this is where we can talk about the ordinals uh, situation. Mm. But um, uh, so I, I don't think that there is a, uh, you can't look at it objectively. And people say, hey, there's no such thing as spam, right? If you're paying a transaction fee, then it's not spam. And I think that they're right in the sense that when there's congestion pricing because there's too many honest transactions, real transactions, that is indistinguishable from a spam attack. It's just a it's a distributed denial of service attack. Uh, it's not malicious because people are just trying to, um, you know, it's because there's a bull market and they're trying to arbitrage between exchanges. Um, but from the system's perspective, if if we're neutral on what the use case is, then Yes, it's it's something that has to be mitigated through higher transaction fees, and that these higher transaction fees will essentially drain the attackers' "quote unquote" resources um, until they don't have those resources anymore because they've spent them all on transaction fees going to miners. Um, and so, I think that's really the only kind of uh, attack per se is uh, just denial of service attacks by having too many transactions, whether it's actual spam or legitimate transactions um, and that the way it gets mitigated is just higher transaction fees. You don't think there's a scenario where people are incentivized just to attack Bitcoin to destroy the reputation of it as a system? So I don't think that that um, actually, like in terms of how much they damage the reputation, it's just never enough to justify the cost of the attack. Right. Um, and so, for example, you know, in 2017, transaction fees went up a lot, and Bitcoin did get get its reputation damaged in terms of hey, before we thought of it as a low fee, you know, way of uh, avoiding banks, and then afterwards it was like oh, this is a high fee, um, you know, system, and so it took a hit reputationally, but ultimately, I don't think that that was like. Uh, something that is, is going to undermine Bitcoin medium or long term. So, what do you think of ordinals then? I, I think they're a distraction. I mean, yeah. uh, that's uh, you know, just just like with altcoins, it's like okay, well, uh, they they distract from this idea that you know, fix the money, fix the world. Like that, that is what is interesting about Bitcoin, and that you know, the uh, other parts of it are. Like putting JPEGs on the blockchain is less interesting mm. from my perspective. But so you're not opposed to it. You just think it's a distraction, maybe annoying. Well, I mean, if if I think it's a distraction, then you know whether I'm opposed to it. It's like, yeah, I am opposed to it, right? Um, do I think that it should be illegal? No. Like, <laughs> uh, uh, do do I think that Bitcoin's rules should be changed to stop them? So my view has been that if if the transaction fees are not 
if if they're driving up usage of Bitcoin block space to the point that the transaction fees are really high for an extended period of time, then we do need to look at, okay, beyond just this mechanism for preventing a denial of service attack, is there a change that we can make to the Bitcoin protocol that would increase the cost of this kind of activity um, so that it levels the playing field with other transactions? But I think the reality is that the high transaction fees uh, did essentially, in addition to it being a fad and you know people lost interest or they've moved on to other things, that um, it actually did mitigate the the problem successfully. And so there's not really any reason to look at for further changes to the Bitcoin protocol. Well, so, oh, sorry. No, to please, add yeah. to your point about distraction, I mean, I think what people, people often say, fix the money, fix the world. And what they're really saying is that individuals need to use the money in a way that can fix the world, right? It really takes people's ownership over their money and responsibility and using it in a way that can fix the world. If we're just using Bitcoin to put things like JPEGs on the blockchain or to use it really in any of these any of these ways where we're not actually trying to make the world a better place, then Bitcoin doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do. So I just think that like, again, I, I would agree with you there that it doesn't need to be illegal, but people should maybe rethink why it is that we're working on this project. Yeah, basically people see um, Bitcoin's freedom as an end, that end and of itself. Um, whereas fr from my perspective, and I think Morgan's perspective as well, um, the freedom is, is, is there so that you can choose to do good with it. Um, and you could all, you have free will, so you could also choose to do bad with it. But ultimately, if everybody does bad with it, in the sense of doing things like losing their private keys, right? Not storing their private keys properly and then having North Korean hackers steal their private keys or only using, uh, you know, or if everybody spends their Bitcoin, its value goes to zero immediately because there's nobody wanting to hold it. So the way that we use Bitcoin, I think, matters uh, from both a moral perspective, but also kind of a, um, the, the you know, how, how successful is this system going to be in terms of improving the world? Um, it does matter how we use it, even though we have the freedom to use it poorly or to use it well. So do you think if people were using Bitcoin for ordinals quite significantly, that essentially is a denial of service attack because it's denial, it's kind of, kind of denying the uses of the system as money. I, I do. And, yeah. and people, people were kind of ridiculing this position of, hey, you're, you, you know, you're crowding out like uh, the global south uh, by, you know, s stuffing blocks with JPEGs. Now uh, somebody can't send a payment in El Salvador, you know, and, um, I think that's that's a that's a real argument in the sense that, um, yeah, if we continue to if if we encourage that and if we decide that hey this is more important um, to have these use cases than to be focused on payments and savings, uh, then yes, inevitably it's it's to the detriment because it is a fixed pie of block space. Um, perhaps you know in the future the block space will increase. Another uh, Ooh. Po yeah Ooh. point of controversy, but. Um, so, so I do, I do think that there's a trade-off. Do you, do, you, do you think at some point the block size might increase then? Well, it increased with SegWit. Yeah, well, it, yeah. It's a soft fault, yeah, right. a soft fault, but. So I think that that could happen again, and I think it will happen again. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, that there's, uh, it, because essentially, for, like, I think that it's important to have small blocks because it's important to keep the cost of running a Bitcoin node low. Um, I think that there's continued improvements in the Bitcoin node software that makes it increasingly efficient. And there's continued improvements on the hardware side of, hey, better internet connectivity, whether it's fiber optic lines or Starlink, et cetera, and better computer hardware, better chips, you know, cheaper memory, cheaper hard drive, et cetera. So with those two trends, I do think that running a Bitcoin node is getting less expensive in some regards. Now, you could point to the growth of the total blockchain size, right, which is now probably around 600 gigabytes. So that's continuing to grow. Um, but I, th I do think that, yeah, long term, there, there will be inc an increase in the base layer capacity of Bitcoin. Where do you debate? Where are your opinions divergent? 
Definitely not on this subject yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't debate that much in Bitcoin, do we? No, I mean, it's some. It's, it, no, I, I think guess, that like it, some of my financial planning positions. I feel like that we've kind of converged over the last decade on a lot of these things. Like maybe if you had interviewed us seven years ago, we would have had more divergent points about how to be responsible with your money. Um, because like, so I've been, a, I have a registered investment advisor. My practice has been around for nine years now. I've been in finance for 15 years or maybe more than that now. I'm Maybe more than 15. No, it's about 15. And just um, for some context on that, uh, yeah. uh, do you now recommend Bitcoin? Yeah. So um, in my practice, um, nearly everybody, we have 42 families and nearly everybody has a position in Bitcoin. Only two families do not. Um, some of those families came through as Bitcoiners who are looking for advice uh -huh. um, on just their financial situation, whether they be 100% in Bitcoin or just, you know, somewhere between 10 and 50%. Um, and then there was a portion of my practice who I spent time actually sitting down with and orange pilling and getting them um, interested in Bitcoin to the point where um, it's about close to two thirds to 75% of my practice actually holds their own keys now. Wow, okay. Um, they That's all cool. have, yeah. like a lot of them have multi-sig of that. Um, and yeah, they're storing their keys. They've got steel plates, some of them. I mean, they're doing <laughs> what they're supposed to be doing. And then I've got a small percentage of my practice where they've got their own keys. We're still working on storage. And we have a very small percentage that still has GBTC, unfortunately, that we've been working on. And then I've got the last two who they're just holding it out and they'll get it when they're ready. <laughs> so, but in that nine year history of the practice, at what point was Bitcoin one of the services you offered? Was it day one or was it maybe a couple so of years in? So I wanted to offer it day one, but it was very murky from a compliance perspective, right. whether or not that was something that I can do. Um, so basically what my compliance consultant said to me was that if somebody asks you about it, you can talk about it you cannot go out of your way to talk to people about it. And I said, okay, fine. And in 2016, I actually had my first client ask me about it. So uh, 2016 was the first time I started advising on Bitcoin. Um, one client in 2016, and then a few clients actually in 2017, and many more in 2018 after the run-up in 2017. And once I had just kind of been getting my feet wet and talking about it, I, you know, the, the rain started coming off. You, you know how it is? It's like you do a little bit, you dip your toe in, and then you're like, whatever, I'll just jump in now. And so um, at that point, without guidance, I just decided like, hey, this is really important. And so um, when people would start asking about gold, I would start soliciting Bitcoin. And then at, um, in 2020, anybody who hadn't, we hadn't touched basically about Bitcoin yet. We just decided, okay, this is what we're doing. Um, and we got people involved in Bitcoin, whether they liked it or not, basically in 2020. Huh. Um, and then from there, worked through um, 2021 and 2022 and all of this year to get people like holding their keys, holding them properly, getting them set up properly and doing what they need to do. Can you recommend allocation or is it really just about education and they have to make that decision themselves. No, no, we help with that. Yeah. Okay. So the thing that's great about having my registered investment advisor is actually the, the SEC doesn't really care about Bitcoin. It's commodity. And so okay. Bitcoin itself, I can actually talk about all day. When we actually get down to the specific investment allocation, because that person generally holds other things, if you're going to recommend an allocation, you're actually are making an investment recommendation. But because I'm a registered investment advisor, I can do that. And so people who come through my practice, we give them specific allocations. Um, I actually, I gave a talk on this at Pacific Bitcoin about how people should be approaching it from an educational standpoint about all the different buckets and how they can think about it. Like if they want to be on the low end or on the high end, what they need to do to be in those positions. So, so what is the split on from low end to high end? What, what do you recommend in allocation wise? I'll yeah. So see where I, see where I put myself. <laughs> um, there's all, there's always the hundred percenters in Bitcoin, especially I'm sure with your audience, there are people who are maybe higher than a hundred percent and I never recommend <laughs> higher than a hundred percent. I do not think under any circumstances you should be levered up to buy Bitcoin. Um, but we do, we're fine with clients having a hundred percent allocation as long as they have an appropriate emergency fund. So if people are really into Bitcoin, they understand the technology, they have really high risk tolerances, then by all means, as long as you've got, you know, at least two to three months, we generally like to see as high as six months really of expenses. So that if something does happen, um, you are not scrambling or selling your Bitcoin at the absolute worst time in order to, you know, pay medical bills or, you know, make ends meet or whatever else it is. And hopefully, you know, people aren't in that situation, but it is good to have that emergency fund around. And if from there you want to be 100%, be my guest. What we've found though, is that for most people, 
somewhere really between 30 and 50% is right. And the reason why is because Bitcoin is long-term savings. It's not a short-term asset. And so in my practice, we do something called asset liability matching, which is just a fancy way of saying anything that's going to happen in the short term, we match that with a short-term style of asset. And right now, fiat, cash, um, and even short-term bonds is something that is appropriate for something like that. And anything you're going to be doing in the long term, like retiring or sending kids to school in 20 years, you know, things like that, you can own Bitcoin for because it's a long-term savings event. Um, But anything under that five-year mark, if you're going to go buy a house in, you know, three to six months or two years, right, saving in Bitcoin for that is inappropriate. And so, or you want to go start a business relatively soon, right? These are nice things that people want to do, not necessarily emergency things, but it doesn't make sense to be 100% in Bitcoin if you're going to do those things. And so um, what we found, at least what I've found through research and working with clients is that 30 to 50% is generally right. Um, And really most of my clients end up in that 45 to 50% range. Um, and as long as they can stomach the volatility and have a high risk tolerance, then it's going to be fine. Um, but but basically, because of what's been going on in financial markets um, and what the government has basically been doing to our money, we have been forcing people outside of their risk tolerance for a long time in my practice. I mean, we're stretching the bounds of what people generally want to be doing because most people, they don't want to be 100% stocks, right? And so, but in order to match inflation, to meet long-term goals and to do all of the things that people want to do in their lives, they're being forced beyond their risk tolerance on a regular basis. And so in my mind, Bitcoin, even though it's a volatile asset, you're actually not being forced beyond your risk tolerance because it's a savings vehicle. Um, and it doesn't have all of the other monetary pressures that every that the inherent system and investment does have. Um, and you don't have the systemic risk of a company. You don't have the worries of a CEO stepping out who, you know, was making magic at that company. You don't have worries about fraud happening in that company, right? There are so many things that people don't think about when they're thinking about stock market investments. Um, And because it's become so commonplace to just hold index funds, we are starting to just be removed from what an investment itself actually is. And I think that people should be removed from that. I mean, most people, they should not be spending their time trying to pick the right stock. And so if anything, Bitcoin removes them from that and gives them the, the security but over a long period of time, right? Not over that short period of time, which is how we end up with that 45% allocation. Is there a funny dichotomy that you have where you are you have some clients that may be up to 100% Bitcoin and you're trying to make them hold their own keys? So you're in this, essentially giving up customers, I assume. Yeah, so um, I would say for the average advisor, that's going to be a problem. Um, in my practice, we charge a flat fee based on net worth. We don't charge an assets under management fee. So um, that removes the conflict of interest that I have where normally under that circumstance, I would be trying to hang on to clients' assets as much as I could and not having them buy Bitcoin. Um, but because of how I charge, I could a client could hold literally anything. I mean, we don't obviously want them, you know, buying pogs and having that be how they save for the future. But like if they wanted to do that, you know, and we include that on their net worth statement, theoretically, I could get paid on it. We don't do that, obviously. But um, it's it's nice, though, because then we're kind of asset, asset agnostic um, and can really look at a client's specific situation and decide what's actually appropriate for them rather than it being like, well, I'd really like to get paid 8K on this client's account so they can't take out any more money, you know, that kind of a thing, which does happen in the advisory world all the time. And so with any of your customers, what are their main fears with Bitcoin? Obviously, volatility is one. Does it, is it still that kind of irrational existential fear for Bitcoin? Yeah, so I think there's a split for sure. There's the like the hardcore Bitcoiners that have come in through my practice in the last few years who they're actually, they're more worried about what's going on from a macro perspective globally. And I think it's because, you know, they listen to podcasts all the time and they're tuned in to all the macro that's, you know, being thrown around on not, I'm not bashing you in any way, well, but no, I'm sure but you've actually, got macro people coming on here and people, they, I mean, I hear what, clients fears. They come into my practice and like, they can't travel anymore. They can't do it. Like they're hamstrung by the amount of doom and gloom that's out there. And I agree, like it is, it's a sad situation that that like the world is in for sure. And so there's that aspect of it, which I think is affecting Bitcoiners and affecting Bitcoin psyche for sure. And I think especially because the price hasn't gone up, right? Like when the price is up, people don't care so much about the world being on fire. But when the price is down and the world's on fire, people are, you know, they're not very happy about the situation. And on the other side of that, I've got, you know, my, my clients who, they've been with me a while, they trust me. And so we've been talking about this new asset class. And for some people, they've jumped onto it because 
oh, this is something that's exciting. It makes sense. And I get what you're saying to me. And for other people, they're sort of, you know, they're like, okay, I get that. Like, I should guess I should have this as some sort of insurance policy is kind of how we've been explaining it. Um, but they're not really on board. And I've gotten everything from the quantum computing question to the, you know, it's going to warm the earth by thousands of degrees question, you know, all the regular things that you hear in the news that are bad about Bitcoin are generally what people ask me about. Oh, isn't it only used for drugs? That kind of stuff. And so we just sit there, you know, because my practice is small, I can take the time and actually explain like, no, this is why this is not a thing. Or here's, you know, somebody who you might want to listen to who's smarter than me who can talk about the environment. It's interesting because you you bring up the points of FUD and Pierre, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is that I feel like in the last year, we've started to see Bitcoin recognized legitimately in certain corners where it never was. You know, there's certainly a growing number of politicians. Um, I think Dennis Ford has done some great work uh, reaching out to politicians and trying to educate them on Bitcoin. We've seen some better articles in the press. We've seen Bitcoin being used you know, with the miners, uh, what's been happening at ERCOT, but I think in other places as well. You know, we've seen the work that's been done to perhaps uh, use miners at uh, landfill sites. There, there feels like a growing legitimacy, which isn't just coming from Bitcoin and saying, yeah, this is great. Uh, actual legitimacy outside of our historic circles. And, and is that something you're recognizing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think it just has to do with Bitcoin became like a macro scale asset um, in the past cycle. Um and so now it's on the scene, and it's also the case that it hasn't gone away. I think that when, whenever there's a news article about Bitcoin in a bear market, like a lot of reactions are like, surprise that it's still on the scene and still functioning. Um, the interesting thing is that the more politicians want to attack it, the more there's other politicians who want to defend it, right? Because then it becomes a political football um, and we've seen that dynamic play out as well. Um, but the, the, the other challenge has been, you know, with FTX and Sam bankman fried and, and now he's on trial, but th- his involvement in politics and also in the world of finance, right, that he was meeting with prominent financial figures um, that they felt like they got scammed, <laughs> Um, after that. And uh, it raised the real question of like, okay, well, if FTX went to zero and he's going to jail, uh, but Bitcoin is still here, what's different about Bitcoin that, you know, it's not crypto per se, or it's not uh, part of kind of the scam aspect of it. Um, But I also think that, yeah, as you mentioned, Dennis Porter, um, there's also like Bitcoin Policy Institute. um, Raya has hired a head of public policy, Brian Morgenstern. And so I think that there is a recognition within the ecosystem that in order to kind of make sure that the truth is uh, being talked about rather than just sound bites, um, that we have to invest in education uh, at the political level. Um, and we also, you know, Riot does a lot of investor relations where the question is, you know, if you can't understand Riot's business without understanding Bitcoin. So let's start by talking about Bitcoin. So I think even the rise of the large publicly traded Bitcoin miners has made it so that it opens up conversations about Bitcoin in traditional finance um, that might not have otherwise happened. The, The big dam, the big blocker right now is the SEC, Gary Gensler, and then really Elizabeth Warren behind that, right? Elizabeth Warren is like the puppet master in terms of financial regulations in the United States. And um, her uh, rabid uh, anti-Bitcoin stance and anti-crypto stance, uh, I think- Do you think she's bucketed them together and she doesn't understand the difference? uh, Yes. And no, I disagree there. Really, oh, okay. I think she understands the difference. I, I, I don't, I don't think that she, I don't think that she, that she might know that there's a difference, right? In the sense that Bitcoin's like the number one crypto, but I don't think she sees it as like Bitcoin's ethically different. No, I don't think she sees it as Bitcoin is ethically different, but I do think that she sees that Bitcoin is a threat to the U.S. dollar, while the other ones are not. They're more of just a threat to individual consumers. Perhaps, yeah, I could see that. 
I could be off. I don't, I'm not inside the head of Elizabeth Warren, right. but when she comes on the show, you yeah, you can ask her. Question her. Question <laughs> yeah. I did write to her. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we, uh, we made, I mean, I don't know if you saw it, but we made a film cause we, we went to riot facilities and we ended up calling it Dear Elizabeth. And I had to write to her at the end because uh, there's a couple of things that stand out for, for me with her. But one of the things as somebody who's considered a liberal is that, uh, if she was able to bring in draconian laws against Bitcoin, I don't think she understands the global impact that would have on the people who need Bitcoin in some of the most challenging geographies. And I don't know if she's connected those dots, but to me, that is that would be my starting level of conversation with her. It wouldn't be anything to do about US dollar do uh, domination, or it would be asking her what she thinks about people who live under authoritarian regimes with capital controls or people, you know, activists in you know, certain markets, what she thinks of, you know, women who can't access bank accounts, all those things where I think it would be a nice way to trap her and just explain to her the difficulties she, she would bring. But has anyone actually got close to what her real issues are? You, you said it's dollar domination. I think so. I mean, she's, she's she actually pretty that? smart. Um, I would say like of the senators out there, she's one of the smarter ones. And so it just seems to me just based on who she is and what she can understand that she would be able to understand that Bitcoin is a threat to the U.S. dollar and it is a threat that the government wouldn't be able to use the money, the printing presses basically if it were to take over. Um, and that does affect her significantly, right? I mean, that's, yeah. So that that's kind of my take on it, but I, I could be totally wrong. I mean, I don't know her well enough to know whether or not that's actually what she thinks. And so is... Gary Gensler putting her strings for her, or she pulling his strings, should I say? Yeah, yeah I think she's, <laughs> she's pulling his strings. And I, I think ideologically, like, she thinks uh, money is an institution that should be controlled by the public yeah. through the democratic process. Um, now, granted, we could debate whether the Federal Reserve is democratic or not, <laughs> but, and, you know, she, she's, she's been raging against uh, these interest rate hikes as, you know, being uh, bad for, for the little people. And, She's not necessarily wrong on that, um, but um, I think it is. I, I think it is genuinely ideological that she wants uh, the monetary system to be under her control or the control of a democratic political system. The other part of it is that um, she's very uh, hands-on with it, right? So she personally lobbies other senators, and she's gotten m m like more than a dozen co-signers on her bill that would effectively outlaw Bitcoin mining in the United States, along with a lot of other crypto activity. And so, um, but I still think she's she's a minority uh, in, in, you know, she won't have enough votes to, to pass that law, but she clearly feels strongly about it enough that she's personally involved in trying to persuade others in the Senate and eventually in the House to to see things her way. I know you've um, done a bit of work on the policy side um, alongside Dennis and a few other people, I'm sure. Um, there's a lot of Bitcoiners that would say we shouldn't engage with politicians and regulators. Do you, I assume you disagree with that take? You don't see him in DC with a suit on? Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> Mountain Man Pierre was gone. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I do think it's, it's important to engage. Um, and, and I, I would shout out to Lee Bratcher from Texas Blockchain yeah, yeah. Council as well. Uh, he, he's been a, a mentor of mine in, in kind of understanding the political landscape in Texas and nationally as well. Um, and uh, I think the, the reason why it's important to engage is because politicians are influencers in normie world, right? And so it, from my perspective, it's like if we can orange pill politicians— and then when they're giving a campaign speech and they say something good about Bitcoin, they're helping orange pill, you know, hundreds, thousands of people. And so it's like, I don't see it so much as like, oh, we need to get uh, good laws passed, although, you know, that, that would be nice. I also see it as, hey, this is an effective way of getting the word out about Bitcoin uh, is through the um, political process. And when you're there, are you, are you noticing like a similar uptick from like Democrats and Republicans or is the one party that's kind of getting on board more? I, I think that it is bipartisan mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and in fact, what we saw in Texas was that um, the there was a, a bill introduced in the Senate, uh, in the Texas Senate by a Republican. 
Um, and so there's definitely, that was anti-Bitcoin mining. Okay. And so, you know, we, people often focus on Elizabeth Warren as we just did at the national level, but uh, a lot of the people co-signing her bill are Republicans and their concerns are around, um, part of it is kind of weird conspiracy theories of, oh, Bitcoin is invented by China to like take up all of our electricity or, uh, you know, is that a real, is that a real one? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's kind of like, there's, there's like this QAnon element to it. Right. Okay. Um, and it's just driven by misinformation, disinformation, uh, going around the internet these days. People can just write anything. Um, or, or, uh, that, you know, from their perspective, it's like, it's not a productive use of our resources. Right. So electricity should be going towards manufacturing, not towards, Bitcoin mine. And air conditioners. And air conditioners. That's right. It gets really hot in Texas. Um, and then the kind of the nimbyism of like, oh, we don't we don't want it here because we see it as a nuisance. Uh, even things like the air-cooled Bitcoin mining can be too loud if it's adjacent to a residential area. And they're right. Like, you shouldn't build a giant, you know, air blower right next to where people live. Um, but uh, there, there's that aspect of it. Um, I think, though, that the, it's basically the extremes on both sides um, can have reasons to really not like Bitcoin, whereas the more moderate centrists um, are aligned that, hey, this is innovative, it's creating jobs, and it, there's not really um, these massive negative externalities that the critics try to you know, attach to it. I think also on the job front, I mean, it's not just creating jobs. Like for for instance, in Texas, they um, they did these tax abatements for companies to basically to create jobs there. And so what they found, with, let's say, like the solar companies, a lot of them like it took advantage of these tax abatements, but then they outsourced these jobs. So even though the company was based in Texas, right, the jobs themselves didn't actually come to Texas. Whereas like the mining facilities, right, they're doing everything there. So they're actually creating jobs in the location in which the, they are built. And so I think it's just, it's a difference, right? This is not when these jobs are created, they're actually created rather than it just being sort of, you know, taking advantage of the rules type of a thing and still being able to outsource. And if you witness firsthand, uh, whether it's DC or wherever, but uh, the conversations with these politicians, whereby you've you've kind of seen the light bulb click for them. They they've had maybe uh, pre pre held opinions from things they've read, but where you've actually explained things to them, they've you've seen them have that moment. Yes, uh, one in particular uh, had a background in software development, and when I explained to him that it's open source, and that you can see the source code yourself. I saw that light bulb moment in his eyes. And so I think that you know, different things will di click for different people, but that was one where I was like, hey, I've, that was a solid win right there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And what was it like going down to DC and just doing all this? Because I've got to admit, when I first saw you in your suit in DC, I, it's not that I was surprised. I, I, I was more like, oh, well, this is cool because Pierre's down there doing this and Pierre understands everything about Bitcoin. But at the same time, I was a little bit surprised. It's like, oh, oh shit, yeah, Pierre's down there doing that, you know. Yeah, um, I, I don't like being away from family. So in, in that regard, you know, it kind of feels like it's a big time investment. Um, yeah. But I, I also, you know, I got to run into Jamie Dimon uh, in, in... I remember. Uh, he was lobbying because, you know, they need to get bailed out. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, this was, you know, right around uh, Silicon Valley Bank. So. What did you say to him? So it was I, funny. I, I when you told I, me, I, I, I can't remember. I told remember. him, "Hey, Jamie, I'm a huge fan of yours and what you're doing. Can, can I have take a quick selfie with you?" And he goes, "Yeah, sure." So I took the selfie, and then he asked me, "What do you do? What are you doing here?" And I said, "Well, you know, I'm uh, with a Bitcoin miner, uh, Riot." And he just kind of like smirked and walked away. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that you know, so you, you get to meet interesting people. But I think that the the other part of it is that um, in in Congress, these staffers they're the ones who um, are kind of trying to absorb all this information and distill it down for the senator or the representative, and they have to deal with a million different issues. So like. I'm very single track, like I just talk about Bitcoin, but they got to deal with like Medicare, you know, health insurance reform, uh, 
gun reform or whatever. You know, they've got like every political issue uh, that they're trying to get the right information about, foreign policy, <laughs> all this stuff. So in a way, um, for, for them, it's, it's helpful to have someone come and be able to answer their questions because their line of questions often is like they're trying to dig deeper than what they read in an article. Um, and it's really hard from outside the industry, if you're reading a New York Times article or a Wall Street Journal article, to find the subject matter expert who would be able to like provide more context or a counter argument to something that they read. So I think it's, 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 it's important uh, for, for Bitcoiners to do. Um, and I, I enjoyed doing it. Um, you know, there's lots of smart people who work in DC. There's some people who are not smart who work in DC too, but they're very friendly in either case. <laughs> do, you, do you have a similar scenario with other financial advisors? Do you work with trying to orange pill them and try and help? Because there's a lot of financial advisors I know who won't recommend Bitcoin. And I know why. Some of them say it's just not worth career risk for recommending it, or they don't understand it themselves. Uh, do you just want to call into the market yourself, or do you actually want to increase the number of Morgans there are? Yeah, so we actually have a small network. It's called the Bitcoin Financial Advisors Network. Okay. I think there are seven or eight of us on there now um, who are, like me, fee-only CFP financial advisors who um, have minimized conflicts of interest and who um, know the financial landscaping uh, very well and also are very well-versed on Bitcoin. And so we are hoping to grow that network. Um, I originally had tried... <laughs> I did try, in fairness. I tried to kind of get out there and get the word out there with advisors. Um, and I thought that it would be easier with some of the newer advisors coming up. Um, there are some groups where, you know, we thought, I thought that I, because I was involved in them, that it would be, you know, these are people in their 30s and 40s. It might be an easy way to get some younger advisors involved. Um, and that was pretty shot down, like shot down pretty quickly for sure. Um, I, I was shocking to me, actually, that, um, Basically, the new age financial advisor is very evidence-based investing, quote unquote, where, you know, doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Like, we just do stocks and bonds. And the reason why they do that is because they've got all this data, you know, going back over 100 years of every single stock market crash and all the news events around it. And every time they look at the chart, it recovers over time. So it's like you just kind of, you know, you just buy your portfolio and you sit and wait and you'll get through anything. Um, and I think that that has generally been true over the last hundred years. But I, I do think that the time that we're in now is unprecedented. And I do think that a lot of these advisors are making a huge mistake now because there's a new asset here that's, it's not an investment, I think is what's not being focused on about it. They just see it as another asset class that you would add to your portfolio, like anything else, you know, you just buy stocks, bonds, and, you know, alternative investments, and Bitcoin would be considered an internal, uh, alternative investment, and we don't really mess around with those things because they tend to not do well over time, which is true. I would totally agree with that there. Um, but they're not looking at it at, for what it is, which is savings, not investment. And so if you're thinking about it in terms of savings, then you're actually thinking about what money is. And most of these advisors actually don't know what money is because when they studied any kind of economics, they studied Keynesian economics. They didn't study anything about Austrian economics or really just the foundations of money in general. And so I think that there's a huge education gap there. And unfortunately, what's happened is that instead of going from no coiner to Bitcoiner, or at least stopping at Bitcoin, what's happened is that we've gone from no coiner to um, cryptocurrency almost overnight. And nobody's kind of settled in the middle. There's that, you know, seven or eight of us that are like, come on, like we're over here. This is the right camp. Um, but instead, there have been other organizations and institutions that have popped up with prominent people who, um, you know, they are including Bitcoin in it. So it's not like Bitcoin's not being talked about, but they're also including the vast array of other um, currencies out there that are, you know, obviously they're irrelevant to client situations. And, and I say that because really what most people need is a savings vehicle, right? For most people, they don't need some, you know, random app on their phone. Like, you know, some people are going to get some use case out of it and it's going to be helpful to them. But for the vast majority of people, it's 
just taking up space on their phone, taking up time and energy, right? Taking up money in this case, just that could be productive somewhere else. And so I think that that's often lost. Um, and the education is so lacking and it's so hard to get the right education in the right place. Um, I had been in talks with the CFP board. Um, the CFP is this, um, it's certified financial planners and, uh, and I have that de designation and they were actually looking for um, somebody to come in with digital asset experience um, to help with the curriculum, which would be the whole new wave of CFPs coming forward. And they actually ended up going in another direction after everything that happened with FTX. They were like, you know what? We just we don't want to have anything to do with this. And so um, I had applied to, to do that and thought that that would be a really good way to like kind of get the message out for financial um, advisors and planners. Um, but it's really falling on deaf ears. And I guess um, I just, I don't think it's a good use of my time in, mm. in, all, in all honesty. I think that um, the best use of my time is focusing on people who have an open mind and who um, really truly need help with their finances and that I can make a difference in that regard rather than trying to like knock on the doors of people who have them shut very tightly. Well, I think it just goes back to that point of adoption being a lot slower than we all think it should be or hoped. But then also, me and Danny were to discuss and debating the other day, but, but maybe adoption is necessarily slow because fast adoption would perhaps lead to even more volatile Bitcoin prices, which could perhaps scare more people off. Is there? A, I mean, I don't know if this is one thing you've done in the history you're writing, uh, Pierre, but looked at the adoption curve of Bitcoin and does it need to be at a necessarily slow pace? So this is where I learned a lot from, from Morgan, which is, the, I think the, why it needs to be at a slow pace is because of the rebalancing of portfolios. Okay. So when Bitcoin has a massive run-up, it has a 10x or 100x, um, everybody who is holding Bitcoin, they're now looking at buying a Lambo, paying off their parents' mortgage, putting their kids through college, taking chips off the table, buying stocks, uh, you know, and and basically trying to... to de-risk because they, you know, for, they've made a life-changing amount of money, essentially. That, or, it doesn't mean that they sell it all. It just means that they trim the position. Yeah, at the very yeah. least. And Which guess, is a redistribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's also important for the decentralization of Bitcoin, too, is redistributing coins to mm -hmm. new people. It is. Uh, but it creates a bear market, mm -hmm. and that negative psychology essentially puts a big break on new adoption. And so then you have this distribution phase that, you know, lasts through the bear market, and eventually, the rebalancing process reaches, you know, everybody's portfolio reaches an equilibrium, either because the price went down or because they sold enough. Um, and then that's the base of the bear market. And then from there, that trickle of new adoption will eventually catalyze with the, with the halving mm -hmm. uh, into another bull market. Uh, and then again, that distribution process. So that, you know, that's kind of the hodl waves that Unchained uh, put together as well. Mm. Um, and so I think that's that's what causes, in contrast to that with an, another a different technology, right? Let's say the iPhone, right? Yeah. You don't have that with the iPhone. Apple can just manufacture a bunch of iPhones. And so even if you have a wave of adoption, it's not going to cause the price of the iPhone to skyrocket 100x. And then people are trying to sell their iPhones to their friends, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so that's that's what makes Bitcoin unique. And it's, it's like, hey, that's the nice part about scarcity. But it's also, I think, what causes the adoption curve to be different than other technologies. And there's other benefits to that as well. Uh, scaling being able to scale the technology to understand the scaling needs for allowing the pace of development, the uh, the acquisition of new developers, it, it almost feels like sometimes a little bit scarily perfect. Um, well, I'd say maybe that's a cope because, yeah, maybe. Uh, you know, Bitcoin worked in 2012, you know, like it functionally. Uh, yeah. And so, um, you know, there have been tremendous improvements, but... If we think about, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's it's enabling Bitcoin to scale in a way that's more non-custodial than it otherwise would have. If if it had just been an overnight phenomenon, then it would have been purely custodial. But at the same time, like you know, I think we recently found out Coinbase has like this massive percentage of the Bitcoin supply is with Coinbase, um, just you know because it's convenient. Uh, and so I think that um, even with all the technology improvements product improvements for non-custodial, uh, that doesn't really take, has not taken a lot of market share from, from Coinbase. 
a topic that comes up a lot at the moment is uh, BlackRock ETF. Morgan, do you think that's uh, good or bad for Bitcoin? Don't look at Pierre. Uh, <laughs> I don't, um, I actually don't have a view about that either way, um, to be honest, which I know is not necessarily answering your question. What I think about it is that, so this is what I saw with clients with GBTC. And yeah. so most clients, when we got them involved in GBTC, they had a lot of questions about what it is and how it worked. And most of them from GBTC actually wanted to outright own Bitcoin. So I think an ETF is positive because it's a it's, bridge. It's a bridge, yeah. Mm. It's a, and it's the best way to for somebody to get involved and not have um, the issues that GBTC has as basically a private placement that trades as a closed end fund on the market, um, or to be leaving coins on an exchange, right? Um, just because that's convenient, right? I mean, it it is a little bit better for because at least in this situation, right? If a client is leaving coins on an exchange, we don't really know what that exchange is doing, right? But there's going to be clauses and so forth in the perspectives of this ETF where whereby um, like there's going to be more security on how this is held than let's say just holding it at like an FTX type place, right? If that's where you're keeping your Bitcoin. So in some ways, it's a really good bridge for people to get involved in Bitcoin, see what it is, right? In other ways though, it's bad for Bitcoin, right? Because it's bad because if people get too comfortable with mm -hmm. this ETF, because it doesn't have as many problems as some of the other ways of holding Bitcoin, then potentially, right, they end up in a situation where later on they have to convert out of their ETF and into actual Bitcoin when they want to go use it later. And so that's what we keep talking to clients about because I think to add on to your point about like adoption and rebalancing and all these things is that most people, when they buy an investment, um, they're not thinking about, you know, holding this investment for infinity number of years. Um, they're thinking about, okay, in retirement, I'm going to sell this investment. I'm going to get dollars and I'm going to go use those dollars to fund my retirement, to pay for my kid's wedding, to go take a trip around the world, whatever it is that they want to do. Right. And so, when we're talking to clients about this, what we're telling them is, okay, you're young. Our hope for this asset is actually that you don't convert back. And so they're like, what are you talking about, right? I'm in the future, I'm going to use that. You know, it's like, so for some people, it's a really foreign concept. And so I think that's what makes Bitcoin a little bit different, right? In that regard where there's some rebalancing going on, but like for the hardcore Bitcoiners that are out there who they're looking like at this in the future is something that they're going to use as money and that they're never converting back. And so there, but there's the rest of the market that doesn't doesn't view it that way, that mm. you views it the standard way that you would approach assets and rebalancing and so forth and kind of adjusting based on your lifestyle. Um, and so to get back to your question about the ETF, right, then if people are putting money into this ETF, they don't have that opportunity later, especially with the BlackRock ETF. Um, and that's what definitely what some Bitcoin companies have sort of pounced on of like, well, you can't convert out into Bitcoin. You can't withdraw in kind, which is true. You can't. Um, and so people really should be owning Bitcoin outright. But for a lot of people, right, having them hold their own keys is maybe not appropriate. And I think that that's kind of, it's it falls on deaf ears sometimes in our community. Um holding your own keys is not hard, right? It's it's not, right? You write down your 12 or 24 words, right? You store it properly. You move the Bitcoin. You copy, paste an address, right? It's, it's not that hard at the end of the day. Um, but it's not the difficulty of it that's the problem. It's the the fact that you're literally holding your money in your hands. That's mm. the problem. And so people just need to become more confident and capable of doing that because we now live in a society where we never do that, right? Like we think of these kind of strange people who are keeping, you know, mat like cash in their mattress. Like, what are you doing? That's nuts. Um, and so people have never, like we haven't done this in years. And so I think that that's more of the re-education process of like, okay, you can do this and you don't, you don't have to be in a situation where you lose your money. And I think that like for most people, that means multi-sig. And so from there, it means, okay, figuring out storing in multiple locations, which is hard for a lot of people, right? But um, that at least like, I think that like the number one opportunity really in Bitcoin is not the ETF. It's making multi-sig something that people can actually use. And if we do that in a way where um, it's very user-friendly, where people can, you know, really take ownership of their money and figure out how to store properly, then this is what I think that'll actually make Bitcoin really take off. I think multi-sig is pretty friendly now if you're using Unchained or Casa. I think both those tools are particularly user-friendly and I'm, I'm sure there's other similar ones. I also wonder if like the ETF probably good for business for you because it's going to open up a potential larger uh, base of clients that you can go for who've now had Bitcoin exposed to them as, oh, this is okay. Because Larry <laughs> says it's okay. So you, but, you, but hopefully you'll be ready to teach them to buy themselves and custody themselves. Yeah, that's my hope is that we would go from the ETF to um, 
to holding it properly for sure. I agree with you there on Casa and Unchained. I think Unchained has a great product. Yeah. We actually use Unchained for a lot of my clients. Right. Um, I think that there are people who want to do it without a third party being involved. Um, and that is, that's more difficult for sure. Um, that would and, give me anxiety. Yeah. And not necessarily something that is widely available to the average person at this point. Yeah. How about you, Pierre? Because uh, for me, the I go back and forth on the BlackRock thing. Sometimes I think it's good for Bitcoin because it would lead to yeah, massive exposure and legitimacy again. But also at the same time, it's not great for the Bitcoiners are holding the asset via BlackRock. Yeah. I, I think that eventually they will enable people to deposit and withdraw Bitcoin. And so um, that, you know, we saw this with Robinhood, where at first they launched Bitcoin trading, but you couldn't actually deposit and withdraw. Same thing with Fidelity. Um, but eventually they do enable it. And so I think BlackRock will realize that it's in their commercial self-interest to be able to uh, do that. And so I, I just see it as BlackRock joining the Bitcoin network. Um, and uh, that's great news um, just because of how big they are. Now, I know that there's people who are like, hey, you know, they're pushing their agenda and this is, they're going to try to influence Bitcoin or fork it. And I think that's somewhat delusional. I don't think that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, mm, okay. And uh, that, you know, Bitcoin changes you, you don't change Bitcoin. And that there applies to Larry Fink as well. I love so that. With the, uh, obviously, they've been pretty stringent on the rules around. Like only accredited investors can actually withdraw. Why would they open up deposits and withdrawals? Because presumably that's a one-way thing. Like no one would want to put Bitcoin into that, you wouldn't imagine. There's no real benefit to putting Bitcoin into an ETF. Well, um, un unless the, the ETF might be trading at a premium and you could then upgrade, you know, you, you, you know you'd be able to profit off that arbitrage without having to take the steps of, converting your Bitcoin into dollars, wiring the dollars to BlackRock, and then converting the dollars into the ETF. If you could just convert the Bitcoin into the ETF directly. Would, would that not open up to then just like a big player arbing that back to sort of power and then real retail investors probably have no opportunity to do that? Right. And, you know, maybe the deposits and withdrawals will just be for other large institutions. You know, Fidelity will be sending a Bitcoin transaction to BlackRock. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so, not necessarily a bad thing, though, because it then will keep the, the net asset value where it's supposed to be. So arbitrage in this instance would actually help the average investor who was holding it rather than being a detractor. Yeah. And, and it, it grows the Bitcoin network and it grows kind of... It, I think that a lot of times people don't really understand Bitcoin until they actually use it. Mm -hmm. And so this is, you know, they're going to be actually using it. Um, and that's, that I think is eventually going to have ripple effects onto other equities where, um, for example, if you do have, if you are Fidelity and, uh, you know, a Bitcoin whale wants to, again, because the Bitcoin price went up 10x, they want to rebalance they might want to trade their Bitcoin for stocks directly rather than going through kind of the conversion uh, and the costs associated with that. Do you think Gensler is going to get out of the way? I, I think that uh, it's going to depend on the presidential election. Yeah. Because he's not, no, so no, he's not going to get out of the way. You think he's going to <laughs> <laughs> he's he, gonna yeah, drag he, his feet as long as he can. And, and he's doing what the Biden administration wants him to do. And so um, they're not, Biden's not going to fire him. Um, Congress would have to really, there's a, a high bar to, uh, I know Warren Davidson has introduced a really great bill that would eliminate Gary's position, <laughs> create uh, a new set of, I think, three people who would be leading it. And so it would, you know, be trying to, to unblock things there. But I don't think that's, that's going to pass anytime soon. So it's really going to depend on who gets elected in the next uh, uh, presidential. Interesting. It definitely does open the door to, to advisors. I think if the if the SEC approves a product, right, the the compliance departments of all of these large firms can no longer say, "Hey, this is something we don't have guidance on anymore," right? Yeah. In which case, at that point, like the advisors are going to have to educate themselves on this as a product. They're not going to just be able to sell this Bitcoin ETF without knowing anything about Bitcoin. I mean, there are advisors out there who do that, so you know, maybe don't hold me totally to that. <laughs> <laughs> but the average advisor is going to at least know a few things, right? They're going to at least have be able to talk about it for a paragraph, um, which is good for Bitcoin, right? Because then more people will know more things about Bitcoin. Uh, I would also add, it's, um, 
in addition to a different president, the uh, courts could actually force Gensler to allow for a Bitcoin ETF. Hmm. Oh, yeah. What was that? Um, there Just, was that case that you were telling me about with, with GBTC. the— was it No, it yeah. wasn't GBTC. It was with the futures ETF where the um, the judge basically said that they, like it was worse for investors because investors don't can't possibly understand a futures ETF as well as they would be able to understand a spot ETF. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I, I do. Yeah. Um, I forget which specific case that was, but yeah. that's the other avenue to unblock things is uh, for the legal system to do its thing. And the SEC is keeps losing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they need better lawyers. Um, I got two. Uh, well, better yeah. arguments. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. 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 they just need to be on the right side of the yeah, law. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Learn the truth. Uh, there is a couple of other things I, I wanted to ask you about, Pierre, just because it's been a while since I spoke to you. Yeah. Uh, stable coins on shitcoin protocols, uh, I've seen used in the wild a lot, just traveling with work, and I uh, can be. I find myself anti shitcoin and anti uh, shitcoin protocols, whilst pro stable coins on these shitcoin protocols because I've seen how people use them and the lifeline they have become. Uh, I actually saw Stefan Levera tweeted something earlier. He's talked about why these uh, coins are called stable coins because they're always uh, losing value. And he's right. But as a currency, they are the most stable option for people in uh, places that I've traveled to with work. And I understand why people use them. And so I've become a, a little bit more nuanced about it. I'm glad they exist. I would rather it was uh, on uh, liquid and, you know, the benefits went to Bitcoin and not to Justin Sun, but at the same time, I've seen them used. So I'm like, it's like a, uh, it's like a moral dilemma I have with it. I, I was wondering, like, what you, I'd be really intrigued on in your position with it. Yeah, I, I think uh, the 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 best argument for stable coins is, Pierre, don't you use dollars, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah, I I do use dollars, and so then it's a point of privilege to say that you know I have access to the dollar banking system and I use dollars. Uh, and somebody abroad, you know, uh, I'm going to judge them because they're using dollars, but, you know, on Tron instead of on Visa, which is like, okay, what, what, you know, isn't Tron better than Visa? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, it, but I think that the, the, the other point of the dilemma is really around, you know, what, what Morgan was saying is that you want to have that asset liability matching. So, somebody, you know, we say, hey, you should have three to six months of expenses saved up in your local fiat currency in you case you lose your... <laughs> I'm away. <laughs> <laughs> in case you lose your job. I think you've got good job security. I think I've got three months left. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, um, you know, if you need to have that that short-term savings, um, that's that that's, I find that challenging. Maybe this is an area where I disagree with Morgan. Um, because I do think that um, if if that is constantly being eroded by inflation and you know you're losing your purchasing power, you're constantly having to add more dollars to your short term savings account. Yeah, but I think the point about the emergency fund, it, which is often lost on people, is that at some point it's irrelevant to have it. Because at some point you have so much in assets that it's kind of irrelevant whether or not you liquidate a little bit because you're in some sort of a pickle, right? Like, I think that, yeah, when you get to a certain point, you don't need that anymore, in which case it doesn't really matter that it got eroded in fiat. And like everyone's best hope in Bitcoin is that, you know, you get few, through three, four cycles or whatever, and now you're good, right? In which case you don't need that fiat emergency fund anymore. Um, and so sorry to interrupt you there, but I mean, I agree with you in some, in that regard, because we do have clients constantly adding to these emergency funds because they have to, because of fiat inflation. But at some point, right, we have them stop adding to it because they've amassed enough where it would just be sort of irrelevant if we had to liquidate. And I'm tending to think more of people in uh, developing economies who have a sovereign currency that's inflating yeah. you know, away. And actually for them, in some ways, the dollar is their Bitcoin. So where Bitcoin, yeah, you know, Bitcoin is our savings technology for the long term. You know, I go from pound to Bitcoin. They kind they might go from peso or whatever to Naira to 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 the dollar. And the dollars in some ways serve the same purpose as Bitcoin is for, for us in that it's holding value. But yeah, you know, these people who might be living day to day or week to week, month to month. Mm -hmm. I still think that there's an education part of it too. I think that if you surveyed folks, a surprising number of people think that the dollar is still backed by gold. <laughs> and so the dollar is essentially still coasting off of this reputation as, you know, world reserve currency, et cetera. Um, 
and that that drives adoption of USD denominated stable coins. Um, the other part of it too is like, what what do we want to spend our time promoting and educating people about? Um, I could spend my time educating people about the benefits of using a credit card and using Visa because you you know you get cash back every time you you know I could start doing marketing for Visa, <laughs> but it's like okay, I don't think that even though it might be better than writing checks. I still think that I'd rather spend my time talking about Bitcoin because ultimately I do think that uh, the dollar system is going to rug these people. And um, there's also kind of that regulatory risk overhang of the, the, the stable coins that are backed by dollars in a bank account um, are vulnerable to that bank account being seized. The algorithmic stable coins historically have all been Ponzi schemes that collapse. And so... Um, in either case, I just think that there's not enough discussion about the risks involved. That's basically, you know, why we're here. Yeah. Well, I, 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 it wasn't really what my thought was. Is it, it, it was, I'm still promoting Bitcoin. It's more that acceptance of these tools are useful to people in certain places. And uh, yeah, in, in certain places, I, I would promote Bitcoin, but at the same time, understand some people. Like, Bitcoin's a privilege, to own or use for some people because of the kind of desperate short-term situation they find themselves in. So I, I was thinking it more in, in that kind of perspective that I feel like actually it's, it's yeah, I feel really shitty saying this, but we're fortunate to have these tools available for certain people in certain places. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, without a I've doubt, like, a we, uh, you know, I, I use dollars. So, um, yeah. but the the thing is that we also can't discount the fact that there is a middle class, an upper class in the global south that could be saving in Bitcoin yeah. and developing, you know, a Bitcoin circular economy there. Um, and I think that it's just for, for the same reasons that it's hard for. Um, more some some of Morgan's clients or potential clients to like grok Bitcoin and to you know see the value in it, mm-hmm. um, or you know politicians to to see the value in Bitcoin. S- same applies in the global south, right? It's not that um, in, as you pointed out, like they their local currency might be hyperinflating, but they know that the dollar has been relatively stable compared to that, and so they can't make the leap to. Oh, okay, a decentralized currency. I think it's more of an issue though, too, that because of what you know, what the what is being done to the US dollar, right? These people are being even more affected by, you know, the money printing here and the real lack of care for people's money. Um, so much so that like they would benefit from you know, saving one dollar a week if they could in Bitcoin, um, and or even thirty cents a week in Bitcoin, right? Whatever they could do to just ink out a little bit, right? I think that that's often not spoken about because we often think, okay, somebody has to have you know this, and we've been talking about it, right? The three to six months worth of emergency mon- funny money in order to um, be able to buy any Bitcoin at all. And that's like, okay, but maybe if when you're in this specific cir- circumstance, right, where you're so reliant on being paycheck to paycheck, where inflation actually in- affects you way more than somebody else, um, that using something like Bitcoin would actually protect you from that. Amongst your clients, how much fear is there uh, uh, regarding the kind of global economy at the moment, the state of the dollar, the state of debt, the potential debt spirals. And again, the reason I ask is like, me and Danny talk about this stuff a lot. And I would say for the first time in my life, I uh, I don't know where, where we'll be in five to 10 years. And I don't know what to do specifically with my money outside of Bitcoin. Like, should I pay off my mortgage or should, should I have a massive mortgage? Are we going to see yeah, massively high inflation in the UK? Yeah, we've had 10 to 15% over the last year or so. I've seen how this plays out in other jurisdictions. Could we have 40%, 50%? I I, I don't know. But I'm definitely highly concerned that it can come to where I live now for the first time. Mm -hmm. And and are you having that amongst your clients? Yeah, so... The reason why this conversation of owning Bitcoin was so easy to have is because people see that their dollar is buying less. It's not 
hard for people to see inflation anymore. I think in the past it had been. And so what actually was sort of an interesting thing, a phenomenon I saw in my practice was that wage growth hit first. And so all of a sudden, everyone's financial picture started looking really rosy. Um, And it should have been a clue to me, but because I hadn't been through this kind of a period in time before, it, it didn't really click that like, oh, this is actually because wage growth has happened before um, consumer price inflation, basically. But what we saw is that everyone all of a sudden, like they were retiring, you know, five, six, seven years earlier than what we had previously projected. Um, and it was like, maybe we finally got them to, you know, increase their income and decrease their expenses. And like, things are looking good, you know, like we were feeling pretty good about the work we had done. And um, no, re- the reality was that there was wage growth, but the consumer price inflation had not yet hit. And so um, that phenomenon has now gone away where like, yes, there's been wage growth, but also now because of that wage growth that people experience and all, because of the free money that people were given, that now they have gone and used that money and prices have now increased. And so because though people are seeing that price increase, right? When you go to the store, I mean, milk is five times more what it used to be, right? It's, I mean, you look at the price of meat and it's ridiculous. Like you can experience it. Whereas before, like, you know, things felt expensive, but it wasn't, it wasn't so like, it was always, it was these pockets of, of places where, you know, oh, maybe people were really wanting a specific service or a specific subscription or something that, you know, was kind of a fad. And that's where you would see CPI increase, but not in everyday day-to-day life. And so I think because of that, that's really opened the door to conversations about Bitcoin because people really, Realize that maybe they will have to opt out and they want kind of that backup plan, you know, like there's plan A of like, hey, we're going to be in this fiat economy and everything's going to keep going the way that we expect it to go and that'll be great. But what if plan A doesn't work out, right? In which case, you know, insert plan B where at least we've got this backup. And so for us, right, like we were talking about the allocation question earlier, and I guess I never actually got to this point of it because we were so kind of focused on the larger allocations. But like for most people, right, the starting position really should be somewhere between three and 10%. And really like the reality of it is that you really don't want that 1% exposure because it's actually not enough if something, if things were to actually catch on fire. Um, You need more than that. And like three is really on the low end and that three to 10% range will protect most people and it won't be material, right? If it does actually go to zero, which is not what I think, I don't think Bitcoin's going to zero. But if it does go to zero, which is something that we can talk to clients about, that, you know, they're not going to be able to not achieve all the things that they want to do in their life, but it will actually protect them in, in case of this, you know, black swan style event that a lot of Bitcoiners are talking about and predicting and thinking about because of, you know, the macro environment in which we live. And I do think that because of what's going on with CPI and consumer price inflation and so forth, that um, that people are thinking about, like average people are thinking about this more so than, you know, just the pundits talking about it. And so it's... It's a it's definitely strange times for sure. I also see there's there's not a bipartisan effect on it. Um, I think that like when there are Republicans in office, my more Democratic clients are generally more worried about the state of <laughs> of like the world, and vice versa. My more Republican clients are worried when you know, somebody like Biden is in office, and so I've seen that you know the flip flop because my my practice has been around for a decade. But um, so I guess it's yet to be seen if everyone will converge, no matter who the candidate is right? Like things are just bad. Um, And I haven't seen that yet, but I expect to see that. Mm. All right. Last thing before we let you go. Uh, What are you looking forward to? Do you still have the same buzz for Bitcoin or Uh, or more? um, (laughs) uh, Probably the same. You know, what I'm I'm looking forward to, we we mentioned multi-sig earlier. Um, There's currently a roadmap on Bitcoin Core to have built-in support for hardware wallets and for multi-sig. And so that I'm excited about because I want to be able to use multi-sig using just Bitcoin Core. It's like the most, you know, highly reviewed uh, code base. And I think that there's a lot of other people who might have that same uh, approach to it. Uh, They just want to use Bitcoin Core with their hardware wallet. And that that would actually grow the uh, number of long-term savings users, you know, beyond its current base and, and give people more confidence and putting more wealth into Bitcoin. So uh, that's that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, I also think that in the next bull market, Bitcoin mining is going to grow a lot. Uh, and so uh, I'm looking forward to arguing with people on Twitter about why 
Bitcoin mining is good and all of that jazz. I think there's a potential interesting uh, argument that's going to become part of that conversation in that, uh, you know, our sponsors are Iris Energy. They've, they've invested recently in AI uh, GPUs and that these uh, data centers for AI are going to be using a lot of power. And will someone like Elizabeth Warren be worried about that? Uh, and, and the people who aren't worried about AI, but we have these data centers which integrate both Bitcoin and AI, uh, uh, um, ASICs and machines and GPUs, that, that presents an interesting argument. It's got, kind of like, well, you can use half your data center for that job, but you can't use it for the Bitcoin. So I think it's it feels like it might uh, put a cloak around Bitcoin and protect it a little. It, it might. I, I also think that it's going to affect the uh, Bitcoin mining industry in the sense that um, currently... AI is growing very rapidly. Bitcoin mining is still growing, at least at Riot. We're, we're building during the bear market, and we're well positioned for that. Um, but in a Bitcoin bull market, we'll see a massive influx of investment into Bitcoin mining that's going to be competing with all of this AI investment. And it's also competing with solar and wind deployment for all of that electrical equipment. And um, in past Bitcoin mining cycles, the constraint has been on the mining rigs. Uh, you know, who can get orders from Bitmain? In this cycle, I think the constraint is going to be on transformers, on you know, electric, large industrial electrical equipment, where every part of the economy is going through electrification, and there, you know, so it's going to be massive competition over this scarce resource, and it's going to completely. I think it's going to change. Um, you know, in past cycles, the hash price, uh, typically it takes like 12 to 18 months for the market to adjust. I think it'll take much longer than that in the next bull market. Interesting. What about you, Morgan? What are you looking forward to? Yeah, so there's a concept in Judaism called tikkun olam, and it's about fixing the world. Um, and it's part of why I do what I do. So when I first started my uh, my career in finance, I was a market maker in equity options. And while it was, you know, kind of sexy and exciting, um, it felt very purposeless to me um, and where you're just kind of moving money around namelessly in the name of liquidity providing. Um, whereas what I do today is, you know, to help actual people live the life that they want to have in a meaningful way. And for me, that's what Bitcoin has always been about. Um, and so... I guess like to be a little bit more specific, I mean, I think that there's a lot in the personal finance arena like um, that already exists in traditional financial planning that can be applied to Bitcoin um, and that we're starting to do. Um, and so like estate planning and multi-generational wealth planning um, and retirement planning, like these are all things that are now like now that Bitcoin's been around for 15 years, people are, are actually asking about these things and wanting these things and needing these things. And so for me, it's really exciting to sort of be on the cusp of that and see the direction that that goes in and hopefully influence outcomes for many families. And so if anyone's listening thinking, Morgan, I need your help. Please help me sort my finances out. Uh, how do they get in touch? Yeah, I have two um, two places. So my Great. registered investment advisor is Origin Wealth Advisors. That's originwa.com. And I also provide um, Bitcoin consulting at moneyowners.com. And the podcast? Our podcast is Bitcoin for Advisors. Um, it's on every major podcast mm -hmm. yeah, outlet. So check us out there. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm at Morgan with an E Rochard. And I also wrote a book called um, The Personal Finance Quick Start Guide. It has a little section of Bitcoin in it. Um, and most of it is fiat financial planning. Um, but I am currently working on a Bitcoin personal finance book as well. So hopefully that'll be out sometime next year. Okay. Well, listen, thanks for coming on. Uh, I think the two of you make a really interesting dynamic together. Um, and Pierre, it's been way too long. Uh, do you want to send anyone anywhere? Um, riotplatforms.com <laughs> uh, at Bitcoin Pierre on, on Twitter and uh, you know my DMs are open if people have questions okay well far too long hopefully we'll do it again sometime soon uh, thank you thanks, thanks for having us